Well, hey guys, and welcome to episode number 35 of the John Campion Podcast on Saturday, July the 30th, 2016. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, here on a Saturday morning, and joining me very graciously on this Saturday morning is Clyder Video's own Wendy Lee. Wendy, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little bit tired. Me too. Um, I feel like I'm still recovering from Comic-Con. It usually <laughs> takes about a week or two, um, but you and I both were lucky enough to avoid the con flu. Knock um, on wood so far, yes. Knock on wood so far. Um, and a uh, little plug to my other show, Film HQ on Comic-Con HQ. We did an entire segment talking about con flu. If you've ever been to <laughs> Comic-Con or any convention, you know what con flu is. But uh, check out our episode of Film HQ. Oh, yeah. I want to watch your closing – what is that called? The final the act. The final act. Because I know we were <laughs> talking about your – your uh, what you wanted to say. Yeah, I actually brought you into my office when I was writing the final acts and just to pitch you the opening <laughs> paragraph. And you x a couple of things, which we won't go into right now, but it was very helpful to me. No, I'm actually doing something that is very against my nature. Um, I know a great deal mm-hmm. about uh, social media, the web, technology. I'm really up on all that stuff. I, as my father used to put it, am as useless as tits on a bull. Nice. Uh, when it comes to handyman work, I am <laughs> hopeless. I am absolutely hopeless. You know this for a fact. I do know this for when, a fact. Because in, um, here in, in the olden my, days, in the olden days when uh, I was the head of Collider Video, um, and I just did something as simple as bought a shelf for my office. <laughs> I had to, number one, get Jonathan Voico, one of our Clyder guys here, to hang them up. And then when I got another shelf, your husband came in (laughs) and hung my shelf (laughs) because I can't even hang a shelf. (laughs) I cannot even hang a shelf. And what I'm doing, what I started doing this morning is I've got this project. We're trying to um, acoustic treat this one room we have that we want to set up a green screen studio in. But the acoustics are terrible. It's very echoey. So I am hanging acoustic foam and... I started this morning. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I'm sure it's going to be a bloody mess, but I've been doing that most of the morning. Uh, but we're going to talk about some stuff today. We're going to talk about Sausage Party. We're going to talk a little about Suicide Squad. we got a bunch of questions that you guys have sent in to me. I'm just going to remind you, if you want to get a question or topic brought up on the John Campia podcast, just email, simplest email in the world, to thejohncampiapodcast at gmail.com. Once again, that's the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. That's how you get a question or a topic, or if you just got a note you want to send to me, you can send it to me there. Now, one of the things that you will notice, I've decided to make a little change. This podcast is no longer in video, is no longer in video form. I just decided that, you know what? I've got a number of things that I do long form video on, and I wanted the podcast to be unique. So what's going to happen is I'm still going to put up shorter videos on my YouTube channel, my movie reviews, my editorials, things like that, three to five times a week. But my full podcast, I'm just going to do that in audio from now on. It just makes life a lot easier for me. And I kind of like having something that's in a different medium, something that's a little bit different and unique. So, And more people listen to the podcast than we're watching the videos anyway. So I just thought I would do it this way. So thank you for your understanding mm-hmm. and all that. Um, and thank, and that way I can convince uh, people to come in and get on the podcast so that they don't have to worry about looking camera ready, yep. which is one of the things you said to me last <laughs> I night. I said it last night. I was like, is this audio or is this video? And he, the second you said audio, I'm like, I'm in because it's early. So I can just roll out of bed and come I can just up. roll out of bed and come in. <laughs> right now, she's in like beer stained sweatshirt and uh, pajama bottoms. It's, it's something to see. Got my Pikachu PJs on. <laughs> Pikachu PJs on. All right. Let's start with this. The first thing we should mention, I did my movie review. You can find my movie review for Sausage Party right now up on my YouTube channel. Um, and how do, my YouTube channel is at uh, youtube.com slash John Campia, and you'll find my YouTube channel. I did my review for it there, but we should probably talk about it. We saw Sausage Party. Mm-hmm. You saw it with me. I did. I got to tell you, there are very few movies. I don't know where exactly it ranked for me, but there were very few movies that I was anticipating more this year than Sausage Party. It might have been my number three most anticipated movie of the year that was neither comic book or Star Wars related. Yeah, this is an original. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I think my number one most anticipated one was The Nice Guys, which ended up being awesome. It wasn't Batman v Superman? 
non-comic book or oh, Star Wars related. Oh, non-comic book. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. So out of the non-comic book or Star Wars related movies, mm-hmm. my number one most anticipated one of the year was The Nice Guys, and it was awesome. Yes. My number two most anticipated non-comic book or Star Wars related movie of the year was Free Stra- State of Jones mm-hmm. with Matthew McConaughey, and that was awful. <laughs> Just terrible I'm movie. Sorry. But I think a solid argument could be made that my number three most anticipated non-comic book or Star Wars movie was Sausage Party. Yeah. I love Seth Rogen. Mm-hmm. I know there are a bunch of people who don't, and that's cool. His humor's got to work for you. But I thought this is the end. Oh, I so can funny. watch that every month. I can watch that movie once a month and still laugh. Yeah. Um, I thought Neighbors was great. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed Neighbors too. I love Knocked Up. Um, Pineapple Express. Pineapple Express. I mean, and and of course his role in the Forty Year Virgin, which is yeah. my all time favorite comedy. I love Seth Rogen. I love his humor and him and Seth Goldberg, who he works with creatively. I've always done great stuff. And I got to tell you, I did not, I did not like Sausage Party. No, I didn't like it. I think uh, for me, I was. I hype I like overhyped myself. This trailer oh, too. really yeah. sold me and I was like, man, this is going to be the funniest animation, adult animation, you know, in a, in a long time because how the jokes was going to be and we all saw uh first and foremost where Deadpool went with that type of humor. Yes. And then this I feel like went a step above, you know, it pushed the envelope a little bit more and I left the theater not 100% satisfied and slightly disappointed. Yeah, you just described most of the women who've been with me over oh, my lifetime. Oh, my. Um, so, <laughs> oh, but no. here's the thing. There are moments in Sausage Party yeah. that are really funny. Mm-hmm. Like, there are, like, unfortunately, a lot of people have been asking me online, are, is, are the funniest moments in the trailer, for the most part, yes. Mm-hmm. But there are also some very funny moments that you could never put in a, in a trailer. No, you can't. No. Um, but here's an example. What, the way I described it to some friends of mine was... Here's the biggest problem with Sausage Party is that the analogy is this. They find a thread Mm -hmm. that is funny. The movie does. Yeah. And so they pull on the thread. Yeah. And then they pull on the thread again and they keep pulling that same thread over and over. So here's an example. This is in the first five minutes of the movie. The movie starts with, you know, going through the grocery store and seeing all these food items that are alive. Mm -hmm. Everything's alive. And so you come to a tomato who's saying... You know, fuck off, you motherfucker, blah, blah, blah. And okay, that's funny at first. You're seeing yeah. a tomato yelling profanities. That's yeah. funny. But then they go right to an onion going, you know, kiss my ass, you son of a bitch, you fucking blah, blah, blah. It's yeah. like, okay, okay, that was funny with the tomato. Well, I guess it's funny with the onion too. And then they go to a donut. Fucking this, you know, fucking. It's like, oh, okay, we get it. And it's like, they do that for like five minutes. Yeah. And it's like, I, I, okay, it was funny at first, but now it's boring. And here's what they did. Because they just went with the profanity, and everybody knows, like, my slope, bring on the filthy. I don't care about that. I love yeah. as R-rated as you can. Be dirty and filthy. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to do something, don't wear it out The so first five fast. minutes. Yeah, to the point that you can't go back to it later. Because yes. what happens is they made us tired of it, or not tired of it, but bored of it. We were mm-hmm. bored of it in the first five minutes. And so when they kept going back to it throughout the movie, it no longer had any impact. Yeah. And they were relying on that stuff, it felt like, to be funny. Mm-hmm. And it really didn't need all the extra profanity. I thought it was a little bit – it got to be, at the end, I felt a little excessive. Well, and that's the word. It's excessive because, look, I don't care how much somebody swears. Yeah. But when it got to the point where you're like, okay, now you can tell they're just throwing in the swearing just, to just it. for it the It was sake like that South Park episode, how uh, they counted how many times they can say, was it shit or fuck? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and so – I found myself sitting there realizing, okay, so now right off the bat, they just ruined seventy percent of the jokes in the movie for yeah. me because they made me bored and I'm, it's it's no longer catching me off guard and it's stale mm-hmm. by the time you get thirty minutes into the movie. And but that's not to say that throughout the film they don't drop some gold nuggets oh, that, yeah. that are really funny. It's just that it was few and far between for me, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. What were your favorite things about the movie? What were some of the things in the movie that kind of worked for you? What I really liked seeing was seeing the food coming to life and right. uh, taking on their characteristics and having this uh, 
unknown sort of like desire to go outside. Like, the what, great beyond. Well, the yeah. great beyond. Like what is what what happens when one of the humans, aka gods, pick us up, and and what happens, and, and how much they desire to be out there, and they have a theme song even yes, that that, that's that goes with it. And I so I really love seeing that. I actually enjoyed watching various food characters interacting with each other, and they even play a little bit on the uh, well. I don't like you because you're this origin of food. Well, I don't like you because you're this origin yes, of food. Yep. So. You know, jokes like that were really funny, um, and I also I because you, for example, they have there's a character in the movie who is a uh, Arab falafel, yes, and a Jewish bagel, bagel. and so they go at it in, in constantly. The constantly. But that was funny. That for some reason that never I never got tired of those jokes, right? Like just watching the because I, the banter was was funny and it kept on going. Um, and and I think the actors, the voice actors, had some freedom as far as uh, being going off script. Yeah, you you could tell, and I enjoy that because I feel like that's where the funniest stuff come from. And also, what I liked was that it, even though I I wasn't a hundred percent happy with the outcome of the film, I. It made an impact on me because I went grocery shopping that night and I went to pick up a bag of chips <laughs> and I looked I at it. What will I murder today? <laughs> and immediately that popped into my head. So it's definitely made an, made an impact. But I feel like, um, I know this is a Seth Rogen passion project and I described this to you in the car. I feel like there just wasn't anybody reining him in and saying, that's enough of this joke. Let's move on to the next thing and let's keep the wheel going. And I feel like this just got away from him a little bit. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly right, I think. I think this feels like a movie where the creators were just given absolutely um, free reign, okay? Mm-hmm. Absolute free reign to do whatever they want. And you can kind of tell that, guess what, guys? Sometimes the studios st- should step in. Yeah. Sometimes studios should step in and say, hey, guys, because studios are filled with hundreds of movie professionals who, for Done the most for part, know time. what they're doing to reel it in and all that kind of stuff. So, look, here's the thing. Right now, the movie, with only eight reviews being counted <laughs> uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, the movie has 100%, but which means oh, eight out okay. of eight. Eight out of eight critics liked it. Yeah. But, but the average score is 6.5 out of 10. Okay. So that means they, uh, that means they like it, but they're just a little bit liking it. I, I came close to liking it because, mm-hmm. like I said, there are moments in this thing. And oh my God, guys, they do the final. Oh my God. About. The <laughs> final, not the final act, the final like 10 minutes of yep. this movie. Yep. Even as crazy and profane and dirty and everything as the whole movie is, they do something at the end of this movie, about five to 10 minutes long. Mm-hmm. That even I was like, I did not think they would go there. I and thought it they, was a great way to wrap it up. It was <laughs> a great way to wrap it up. They do it and it's – it's. I thought you like, I thought I couldn't be shocked anymore in this movie. And then they do something in the last 10 minutes that I'm totally shocked that they did it. <laughs> but it was absolutely hilarious. Yeah, it was It was great. really funny and I was really glad the movie ended on a strong note. Yes, um, they do a lot of racist stuff mm-hmm. in the movie, and at first it was a little bit off-putting. Yeah, but after about five or ten minutes, you kind of got what they were making commentary. Yes, and about five or ten minutes into it, the racist stuff they were doing, I understood why they were doing it and what the point was mm-hmm. of it. And then you buy into it. it's like, okay, I see what they're doing. Yeah, I, but if I got to admit, at first it was making me a little bit uncomfortable. There were several jokes that that I thought made me giggle. I still laugh because I found it funny, but then I felt uncomfortable because I was like, is it wrong? Is something Should wrong with I me? Should I not be laughing at this? <laughs> because I want to. It's funny, but uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, but you know what? Then I thought about it afterwards. I thought, you know what? Good comedy should do two things. It should make you laugh and it should make you a little bit uncomfortable mm-hmm. as you're laughing. I mean, not all good comedy has to make you laugh, but I think some very sharp comedy um, will make you a little bit uncomfortable while you're laughing. And And Sausage Party does that. Look, I, I think if you're somebody, and I mentioned this in my review, if you're somebody that the trailers really worked for you, mm-hmm. I think at minimum you're going to get some enjoyment oh, out yeah. of this movie. Yeah. Yeah. If the, if the trailers did not work for you, this movie is they don't go see, not You should not go, go, see, go see it. <laughs> do not go see this movie. Because there are a lot of movies where, yeah, I didn't like the trailer, but you end up liking the movie. Mm-hmm. Not this case. Yes. If you don't like the humor you're seeing in the trailer – 
this movie is not going to work for you at all. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think even if the trailer does work for you, I think there's a chance you're not going to like the movie. Like I said, I ended up walking out just a little bit too disappointed. Yeah. But your mileage may vary. If you were really into the trailer, go give the movie a shot. And yes. then then let – once you do – because I can't even remember when it comes out. Two I, weeks? I think next week. Next week. comes I out next so. week. I think you know. I think you're right. So once you guys have a chance to see the movie, let us know what you, you know, think. I think it comes out on the 12th. Which would be, oh, in two weeks. In two weeks. In two weeks. So <laughs> one of us is going to be right. Yes. <laughs> I said next week, you say two weeks. I'll look it up here in a second. <laughs> Actually, why don't you p- pull out your phone and look yeah. it up while I introduce the next topic. Sounds good. The next topic is this, and I got to give everybody spoiler alert. We're going to be talking a little bit of Suicide Squad and a piece of news that came out about Suicide Squad. It's not very important, but if you're the type of person that you don't want to know shit about what's going to happen in this movie... Fast forward about 10 minutes through the podcast, okay? I've given you a warning. It's not a big thing from the movie, but it is something that some people will consider a spoiler. So if you don't want to hear anything, fast forward, all right? And Sausage Party indeed comes out on August uh, 11th. It says. 11th. So, yes. it's, yeah, it's two weeks. Yeah. Um, all right. Here it is. News came out. Flash is in Suicide mm-hmm. Squad. Mm-hmm. And it's not a post credit scene, from what we understand. It it's, sounds like he's actually in the film. It sounds like they actually put him in the film. Yeah. Not a big role, not not, and probably only for a little bit. But apparently, during the reshoots, one of the things they did was they threw in Ezra Miller and actually fit it into the movie That's at some point. It is it's interesting. A time hop? I don't know. Hmm. That's a very good question. See, it raises these questions. It, it's to me, number one, I get a little bit concerned because I know on Movie Talk the other day, Dennis brought this up too, yeah. and I thought it was a really good point. He said. Look, reshoots are great when you're doing it to, hey, let's tighten up that scene or yeah. let's let's go with a little bit of a d- different direction with this scene, whatever. Let's add a little bit more of this into the movie. Those things are great for reshoots. Mm-hmm. But Dennis mentioned on Movie Talk, he said, the one concerning thing to me is insert new character yes. into a movie that's already written. Filled like, with characters. Filled with characters. And now you're going to insert a new character. That changes a lot of dynamics. That leads me to believe that it must be a very small part, probably just with Flash and maybe one other character. Yeah. I have not seen the movie, folks. I don't see it till Tuesday, so I'm just speculating here. But it makes me think it'll be small. But then is it going to be that he just ap- appears in the movie as a character? Mm-hmm. Or Oh, like is he Barry Allen or is he the Flash? Yeah, exactly. Or... Does he play a role in it like he did in Batman versus Superman? Does he come through a time rift uh. to say to Harley Quinn, you're important. <laughs> Stay alive. We need you and whatever, whatever. Right. Like when the bat comes, don't <laughs> run. When the bat comes, don't run. Like does he do something like that? Does yeah. he play? So do they do a little bit of a, a theme throughout these DC movies? Mm-hmm. Because, okay, now I'm wondering this. All right. If he does that, let's say they make Batman versus Superman. And and um, Suicide Squad, mm-hmm. Flash shows up in a time portal to a character to give them a warning and a direction. Mm-hmm. Then I, if that happens, I almost guarantee you he pops up in Wonder Woman too. <gasps> I guarantee you that in Wonder Woman, he'll appear in a time rift saying, you're going to meet a man. Find him. Find Bruce Wayne or right. something like that. Seek out Bruce Wayne. And then that's why, oh, that's maybe that's why she was, she was in Gotham. Right. And okay. the thing that she just remembers make, this yeah. thing. So Interesting. And that wouldn't contradict what happened in Batman nope. versus Superman. Look, again, totally speculating here, folks. We have no insight. <laughs> yeah, we haven't knowledge. seen the movie yet. Anna, but anyway, what was your first reaction when you heard that they were going to have Flash pop up in Suicide Squad? Well, first reaction was, why are they telling us instead of just letting us find out in the movie? Look, there's a lot of mm-hmm. heavy hitters in this film already. Harley Quinn, you mm-hmm. know, you got the Joker, and not to mention all the other ones. So the news of inserting a new character this close to the movie coming out, I felt we didn't need it. Uh, I felt that it would have been a nice nugget. Uh, mm. For the audience to see, be like, oh my god, the Flash, and then everybody, you get the buzz going about that instead of pushing this out. Like, look, we have a new character. It's like we don't, we don't need it. We, right. we didn't need it in Suicide Squad, and you know, um, and uh, you know, I monitor the chat room uh, Monday Off through for Friday movie for movie talk. So some in the chat we were talking about on the show yesterday is that if you look at various TV spots, I guess there's only one. It's either a TV spot or the last trailer. You can actually see the blue lightning. 
Something really? one of the scenes you can actually like people I, are like I don't know screaming that was at flash me. That. See, that's what I don't, I don't know. know if that's a flash because that's at a very important moment I think in the movie. Yeah. I don't think they're going to use. Flash so that I don't way. know. I haven't looked back into those trailers to actually investigate this, but there's a lot of people thinking that they've already seen like a hint of the flash in the trailers, and uh, we've already said spoiler for this, right? Yes, they're saying that he's going back for Captain Boomerang. It's what the chats was yeah, I, speculating. I've heard that. I've actually I've mm-hmm. heard that too. Here's. An interesting thing, though. Look, you're asking the question, why did they do it? Yeah. I think the answer comes from Comic-Con. Because mm-hmm. at Comic-Con, I think this is why they announced it. At Comic-Con, one of the big trailers that dropped was Justice League. Yes. And the moment in Justice League that everybody talks about is the Bruce Wayne and in Barry Flash Allen scene. moment. And mm-hmm. everybody loved that scene yeah. with the Flash. And... Ezra Miller playing Barry Allen. Everybody thought that was awesome and buzzing about him, buzzing about him, buzzing. And they go like, oh, uh, we got him in Suicide Squad. But then Maybe we should put the word out to try to attract more mm, people to. It was a marketing tool. I, I get it. I, I do get that. And, you know, they've, they're passionate and they believe this project. That's like they want to show us like they're excited. Look, look at what we have. But I feel like. This is the same thing with Doomsday being shown in those trailers. It's like, you got to stop. You got to stop yeah. showing your trump card, you know? Yeah, but I think they, they're they more concerned right now about getting as many people in their opening weekend as possible. I think, I think there are so many people lined up. I haven't even bought my ticket. I forgot. So now my husband's mad at me because now we're, we can't see an opening weekend because all the theaters we want to go to are, are probably yes, sold out. Yes, but you do get to see it on Tuesday. You're going to see it before yeah, everybody and, on and Tuesday. See, he, we can't talk about that because no. he gets mad. Oh, he's oh like, that's, he's oh, like, that's we, right. Dustin yeah. gets a little bit upset. So, Especially when it's a comic book film, because we're both, you know, right. such fans of those that that genre. And he was like, "So, who's your plus one?" I was like, "Oh, I don't know yet. It's probably somebody from work." And he's like, "I see." <laughs> the Does conversation he, kind of ended there. I, I can see because Dustin, we talked about this in previous. Dustin, who was Wendy's husband, um, the only reason you're here is because of Dustin. Because Dustin, yeah. <laughs> Dustin found out on my Facebook page because he was following me on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and I did not know Dustin. I mean, we. I think we might have exchanged some messages online. Online, and he met you at Costco, That's and it right. was he so funny Costco, because right. he like in the moment of excitement, he forgot your name. Goes, you're you're movie talk guy, AMC guy, <laughs> and you're like, hey, John. <laughs> yeah, I have a name. My name's John. But he saw my Facebook page that I was looking for an assistant, mm-hmm. and he went to you and said, "You got to apply for this." But like, yeah. he probably, I just picture now, Dustin had these visions because I know when Anne was going to go and work for Hasbro, I had these images in my head of her toys, bringing toys. home <laughs> suitcases full of toys every single day. So I could just imagine Dustin having these images in his head. Oh, I'm going to get to go to all the premieres with now. I'm yep. going to get to go to all these screenings. And like when he's like, nah, I can't always make you my plus yeah. one, man. So. I try like for for Star Wars. I made I made him a priority for Star Wars because oh, I, I, I get he's a Star Wars fan first and foremost. So but other ones I'm like, sometimes, you know, I got to give that up for the people uh, I work for and I work with. Yeah, because they have to see the movie. Yeah, to they need to talk about it. <laughs> the job. Um, all right. I'm going to go on uh, move on now, guys, to some of your questions that you guys have emailed in for us. Once again, you can email, get your topic or question on the show by emailing me at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. So having said that, the first question from you guys comes from Patrick. Wow. Okay. Patrick. So So Bless you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm probably butchering that name. And he writes, uh, hi, John, I'm a big fan of your reviews and always value your opinion before seeing a movie. Thank you. Um, my question for you is uh, concerns that I have for the flash and arrow TV series. Mm-hmm. Both shows are great. But major concern I have is that the heroes always question every decision they make, (laughs) and it really gets on my nerves. When it was introduced, I liked it because it kind of made them relatable, but as I kept watching it, it shows a lack of character development because if a hero questions every decision they become, how do they become heroes in the first place? Um, You know, it's an interesting question because one of the things I was complaining about, and I love The Flash. I love that show. But I have two critiques of the flash. The one I talked about a while ago on my podcast, which is why does everybody in the flash have to be a speedster? There are so oh my God. many speedsters <laughs> in the flash and there are more coming this season. Yeah. It's like everybody's a freaking speedster. Everybody's mm-hmm. a speedster. But so that's one complaint, but I love the show. My favorite comic book show on TV right now is mm-hmm. flash. My second critique is Something that I used to really like about the show, and this is something that Patrick's pointing to. Barry Allen is a very flawed character. 
He's, he's a wonderful guy. He's got a great moral compass. He's all that kind of stuff. But sometimes very dumb. <laughs> like he does really stupid things sometimes in the show. And that was cool yeah. for a while because, hey, he's just learning what this means. But like season two ends with the Flash making a decision that I'm going to go back and change time and Everything. save my mom. Everything, yeah. It's like, wait a minute, Barry Dumb. Don't you remember what happened the last time you thought you were going to be a smart guy and go back and mess with history? You caused a black hole that appeared over the earth, almost destroyed the earth, brought Zoom into your reality. Mm-hmm. Lots of people died all because you were a selfish jerk. Yep. So you think at some point he'd learn his lesson. But no, out of nowhere, he decides, no, I'm going to go mess with history again. I'm yeah. going to go back in time again and try to mess with it. Even though the last time you did that, you saw a time shadow of yourself putting up a hand to you saying, don't do this. You know that. You yep. saw that. You experienced. You know that a future wiser version of you was telling you, don't interfere with the past. Mm-hmm. And you learned that lesson because you came back. You had ripped open a black hole, killed lots of people. And then you do it again. Yep. And so that goes right for me back to Patrick's uh, thing about how everything they do, the question themselves. Now, I think there's a point where a hero has to always be evaluating what they do. If they don't, then they become Superman from Injustice Gods Among Us. Mm-hmm. Superman stopped questioning what he was doing and eventually that led him to becoming the greatest villain in the world. Right. And so – I don't mind them questioning themselves a little bit, but I do agree with what you're saying, Patrick, about wanting to see some character development. We need to see them progress. Question themselves about one thing, but then move on and start questioning yourself about something else. Don't make the same mistakes 30 times in a row. And I, I, pardon me, I do agree that I think we do need to see a little bit more of that development in these characters. A- anyway, when you read these, you hear these questions from Patrick, what's your reaction to that? Could not uh, agree with you more. I remember watching that uh, final scene and him running back in time. I'm like, well, what are you doing? You just undid everything we've learned and you've grown as a character. Now you've reverted back yeah. to where you were. And it's just like you said, I think every hero should have an internal struggle. We see it with Peter Parker. We see it with Arrow. We see it with Flash. But it's like they constantly, the writing or however it is, they always fall back to there's no other conflicts except this internal turmoil. Right. And then say so they constantly just revert back to the same issue that they should have worked out already past season one. And why are we revisiting this again in season four? Yeah. You know, and it's like, get some fresh ideas. Let's let him move on. Let him live with that decision because it happened. And uh, as you said, you know, Barry's already messed with history several times. I mean, we had time rates coming after him. Yes. You know, and it's that uh, that was scary. Zoom was terrible. And it's like he stopped thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> he stopped thinking about the consequences this could have on his you know, friends and family that he says he loves so much, but then it's like, well, what happened with that? Why aren't you thinking about everybody else now? And then, you know, and he, it's, it's go, it's, he kind of goes back and forth. It's, I can't do this because this will change history for everybody and, it, and, you know, everything will change. Or I want to do this because I miss my mother. And it's like, okay, Barry, pick one. <laughs> Just pick one. Yeah. And you know what gets frustrating for me too is like, hey, Barry, you doing that? Yeah. You may change something for you and mm-hmm. save your mom, but guess what? Iris may be dead. Yep. Joe may lose a leg in the line of duty. Yeah. Like you could really screw up everybody. Or his father could die. Or your father. And it's not just your friends, everybody in the world. Yeah. You, every, every individual in the world, you could screw up their lives. The fear is this, is if they don't continue just to let him grow uh, as a superhero, is they're going to, he's going to constantly deal with this uh, consequence of if I travel back in time and I change this, then someone, something else happens to someone else. And then it's a constant circle of him running back in time to fix whatever. Right. And I don't want to see that. I'm not saying that, look, the time, jumping through time is something that's kind of a key component to the flash. Mm -hmm. I get that. But, what they did at the end of season two is they had him just repeat a mistake without learning anything new about how to try to make sure there's no consequences. Mm-hmm. Like, like it's fine. Yeah, get back into the Flash time traveling. Yeah. But have him learn and grow and say, ah, 
this is the mistake I made last time. And now I know how to fix these certain mistakes. Yep. But the fact that he did it and mm-hmm. then didn't even consult with anybody about doing it. He just when he did was it putting, on his own. Yeah, he was putting their lives at risk by yeah. doing it and not even consulting them. That bothered me. And it was a great season finale. I like the season finale yeah. very much. Just that one last little moment bothered me. Yeah. I wish they had done something different. All right, we need to move on because we're, <laughs> we're running out of time here. Uh, the next question comes from Brian Knight who writes, After all the great trailers and teasers from Comic-Con, both DC and Marvel, and the poor showing at Star Wars Celebration, (laughs) does Disney and Lucasfilm need to put out a trailer for Rogue One now? I think Rogue One anticipation got buried after all the news coming out of Comic-Con this year. Mm. Uh, What do you think, Wendy? Does is Do you think after all the stuff that came out of Comic-Con, the disappointment people had with Celebration, no Star Wars news at Comic-Con, all this other stuff... People not talking about Rogue One anymore. Mm -hmm. Does Disney need to respond by putting out a trailer now? I think, uh, personally, no. I think they actually know what they're doing. So far, their marketing for Star Wars, just looking at how they did everything for The Force Awakens was very smart. I felt like the the trailers dropped at the right time, even though we questioned it because we as fans want to see it now, today. Um, And I think they know they've got a great thing on their hands and they want to secure... Um, and they have confidence in what they want to show us before they bring it to the table, and they don't want they don't want to rush and just put it out, just to have it out there to compete with um, Comic Con stuff. So uh, th- th- my answer is no. I don't think they need to put it out ASAP. I think th- when the time is right for them, Kathleen Kennedy is going to make the call and say, "Let's do it now," when it's least expected. I think. I think you are absolutely right because here's the thing: you're, you're, the, the question is bringing up an, a, a true thing. It's very true. With all the great stuff that came out of Comic Con, especially on the Saturday, mm-hmm. everybody's now talking about Wonder Woman, Justice League, Doctor Strange. They're not talking about Star Wars, where we're going right now. But here's the catch Disney and Lucasfilm don't need us talking about Rogue One right now. They need us talking about Rogue One in November. Yeah. A month before the movie comes out. The, it doesn't help Disney and Lucasfilm right now to have us all talking about Rogue One right now. That doesn't help the movie. That we're talking about, was August? Well, it's almost August. So like September, October, November. Four months in advance. Look, they've already put up one trailer. It was the first teaser. Everybody knows the movie's coming. But they don't really need to start ramping it up right now. They don't mm-hmm. need to. Look, if they did put out a trailer right now, not a bad thing. If they, I do think they needed to put out a trailer celebration, but that's yes, just I agree with you for there. the sake of celebration yes. and what everybody needs to expect from celebration and all that kind of stuff. But they didn't, so let's move past that. They don't ultimately don't need us talking about Rogue One right now. They need us talking about Rogue One at the end of October, beginning of November. Mm-hmm. And so I think you're absolutely right. If they do it, that's fine. Yeah. But they don't need to yet because we're still four months away. Do you feel that? Ha- let's just say they they put it out like today. You know, or yesterday, like right. about a week after Comic Con, do you think the audience would feel just everything's overcrowded and they're overstimulated by you know the release the release of all the footages and trailers? I don't think so. I think I think I think we we can handle all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I think you got to be careful with that putting out a bunch of stuff about the same movie. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, no, I think we eat it up. I yeah. think we eat it up. We <laughs> love do. seeing the stuff from the properties we're excited about and we're looking forward to. So, like I said, it would be fine if they put something out now. But like you said. They don't need to. Not yet. Uh, All right. Thanks a lot for the question, Brian. Next question comes from Josh Tedeschi, who writes, After Brie Larson was announced slash confirmed as Captain Marvel at Comic-Con, almost immediately, I was seeing people offering up suggestions for who was going to direct and write the movie. The majority of the suggestions I saw were for female writers and directors. I guess my question is, Does the director of Captain Marvel and other big blockbuster female-led movies need to be helmed by a female director? Personally, I don't think it has to be. It just needs to go to whoever at the time is the right director for the project. Mm -hmm. Um, There's two things yet, two ways of looking at this, I think. Number one, does it need to be a female director? No, it doesn't need to be female director any more than a male-led movie needs to have a male director. Mm -hmm. It it doesn't have to. You just need a great storyteller. There's benefit, I think, because let's let's face it, 95% of the movies are not female-led movies. They're they're not. That needs to change. But 
so I think in that case, now when you do have a female led movie, it don't hurt to have a female in the director's chair who can bring more of that perspective to the story Mm -hmm. or writing the movie or whatever. Does it need to be? No, it does not need to be. The other thing we have to take into consideration is this. Look, everybody knows this is no surprise. Very, 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 very few female directors get shots at the director's chair for major motion pictures. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. Very few female writers get their scripts uh, picked up. Mm -hmm. And it ain't from lack of talent. It's from lack of being given opportunity. Yeah. So I think, even though I'm like, oh, geez, don't just make it a token female director because it's a Mm female-led movie. Right. At this point... Where we are, because I think things are starting to change. I'm like, anything that opens the door for us to give more opportunities in the director's chair and in the the screenwriting for these movies, anything that gives us an opportunity and an excuse, if you want, to, to give opportunities to these people more, to these talented directors and writers more, I'm good with. Yeah. I am. I'm totally good with. Look, if I'm the head of Paramount and I'm doing a, a female action movie, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to hear, like, we're going to invest a lot of money in this. I want the best director for the job. All other things being equal, all other things being equal, that's an important thing to say. Yeah. Give it to the female director because mm-hmm. we need to create more opportunities for female directors and they'll, they'll have a better perspective on it. Give it to them, all other things being equal. But mm-hmm. if Steven Spielberg wants to direct it, well, you give it to Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg. Because yeah, that ain't all things being equal. Steven Spielberg ain't equal to nobody. He's Steven Spielberg. Right. So if it's Steven Spielberg, I don't care if it's a female-led action movie, you give it to Steven Spielberg. But he would do it well because he would understand That's how to right. tell that story. Because he's the best there's ever been. Yeah. But if you get two directors, if it, you go through your search and it comes down to two directors and they're practically equal in your eyes. Like mm-hmm. this one has these benefits, this one has these. It's a really tough call. And then one happens to be female director. In the case of that, I would say, you know what? We've got a lot of reasons to go with the female director in this. I would go that way. So does it need to be? No. But I think there are good reasons right now. Hopefully, five years from now, ten years from now, more female directors are being given those opportunities. More female writers are being given those opportunities. So we don't have to have these types of conversations anymore. Mm -hmm. But as of right now, I think, man, anything that gives us a door to open for for these talented directors to come in and direct something big and major – Let's give it to them. I don't know, Wendy, as the only female on this show today, <laughs> um, what's your perspective on this? Well, you know, I agree with you. I think if it's going to be a strong female uh, lead in the film, it would be nice to have a female director to have, you know, a similar perspective on things. But I don't want to have a sake of a female director just because the movie has a female Lead. Yeah, it shouldn't be a just because No, it should, it should never be a just because because I want to see the best storyteller in that position to tell the story I want to see come to life. Now, um, I know a lot of people think that Patty Jenkins is directing uh, Wonder Woman, so now every female superhero will have a female uh, director, and I don't think that's going to be quite the case. I think you you pretty much said it, so I'm just going to echo your thought. Um, what I like to see, what would I, what I would like to see, is more opportunities given to female writers right. and directors. You know, I think um, as long as they're given an opportunity when they're going down their list of directors and the studio is picking, throw a few names in there that are female and give us the opportunity to grow and expand our resume. And I think that's the problem because you look at the list of directors, a lot of the male directors have a very impressive resume because they've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. The female directors, not so much it's because they're not given the opportunities. So maybe the tides are changing and we can see that happen. Yep, I agree. All right. Last question of the day comes from Justin Fawcett, who writes, Just wondering if you've noticed the lack of Mel Gibson in the poster and trailer for Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, On one hand, I can understand it. Maybe even Mel agreed to keep his name off the marketing, uh, keep the initial focus being on the film itself. On the other hand, I'm very angry about this. I think this is BS, and they should have put his name front and center. Curious on what your thoughts are. Uh, you do work for Lionsgate, so I understand if you'd rather not get into specifics, but I believe you're rooting for Mel, as I am. Uh, we love our comeback stories. Braveheart was a coming-of-age movie for me. It always will be. Nothing can replace it. Mm-hmm. It's a great question. Uh, look, I... Mel Gibson... And look, we're putting aside all of the personal stuff for a minute. All of the personal stuff for a second. You know, his rants and raves and you know, drunken 
stuff outbursts, that he did, yeah. outbursts, and you know, I'm, I'm going to put all that aside for a second. Um, this is a different situation from, you know, like somebody killing somebody else mm-hmm. or somebody uh, hospitalizing somebody else. This, this is a little bit different. But And I've got some very strong opinions about some of the things Mel Gibson has done and said. I got some very strong opinions. But there is no denying the dude is an incredible director. Yeah. I have a number of good friends who are directors in Hollywood. And normally when you sit down, say, 10, 10 best directors, directors will often throw Mel Gibson in the top mm-hmm. 10 best directors in the business. He's he's an incredible director. Apocalypto is not a movie for everybody, but everybody who watches that is it's like a good movie. only a few handful of people could have directed that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Mel Gibson was one of them. But here's the thing. Mel Gibson right now is still a figure of controversy. <laughs> I think that's the nice way to put it. Yeah. Mel Gibson is a figure of controversy right now. The fact that he's been given a major picture like this is, I think, a little surprising Mm -hmm. to a lot of people. The fact that he's been given this movie, but clearly they believe in him as a director. You do not owe the director... Look, I'm sorry. Here it comes. The studio does not owe the director shit. They owe the director a paycheck. Yep. That's what they owe the director. They don't owe him anything else. They owe him a paycheck and whatever else is contractually obligated to him under the terms of the Directors Guild of America. Mm -hmm. Other than that, they don't owe him squat. What the studio needs to do, the studio needs to do what is best for the movie. What is best for the movie? And as much as I am a fan of the directing of Mel Gibson and as much as I love this trailer, this trailer was awesome awesome kick a grenade oh my god (laughs) and as much as i am so looking forward to seeing this movie putting mel gibson's name front to center is not what is best for the movie no it's that will turn people off Mm -hmm. not everybody but there are people out there understandably so that you plaster a mel gibson film that's going to turn some people off yeah and turn people and it's going to here's what it's going to do It's going to do what we're doing right now. It's going to make people stop talking about Hacksaw Ridge. And instead, they're going to talk about Mel Gibson. And that's not what the studio wants. The studio wants people talking about this movie. Mm -hmm. So you put up from the director, Academy Award winning director of Braveheart. That's fine. Yeah. But I totally see this from their perspective that... Putting Mel Gibson's name on that poster or putting Mel Gibson's name front and center in the trailer, that doesn't help the movie. The job of a trailer is to get people excited about the movie and to get people talking about the movie. You open that trailer with, from Mel Gibson, done. You've, you've, <laughs> That's it. You've undermined yourself right there. Yeah. Now people, some people are going to be turned off from the movie even before that amazing trailer starts. Mm-hmm. And then people are going to, st- instead of talking about how amazing the trailer is, they're going to be talking about Mel Gibson and whether they should be going to see a Mel Gibson yep. movie. So I got to tell you, for, for me, and yeah, do take it with a grain of salt. I don't even know that. I'll be honest with you, 100% honesty right now. I had no idea this was a Lions game movie. Oh, really? <laughs> I did. I'm not even 100% sure that the question I think, is, I think is accurate. It is, I think it is a Lions game okay, movie. Okay. I had no idea it was a Lions game movie. I do, I do collect a paycheck from Lionsgate. So yes. full disclosure on that. I collect a paycheck from, from Lionsgate. Um, but but I completely agree with this move. This is what you do. Because remember, I think it was the last M. Night Shyamalan movie. I that was came just out. going to say that. Yeah. It was not The Visit. It was before that. It was like produced by him or something like that. And I think it's The Devil or something like that. Something about like the four people being stuck in an elevator and like who's right. coming. Well, they put his name on it. And you, my God, I, I was in the theater when that trailer showed and they popped M. Night's name at the end of it. Boo! The whole theater booed. And I don't, I don't know if that movie did very well in the uh, in, in the box office, but I know due to the some of the misses that M Night had, a lot of people was like they just they stopped believing him. Like, why am I going to put my money in something that it's probably not going to be great? Yeah, I was at a, a movie too, and the, the trailer came up, and the moment it said from producer M Night Shyamalan. The theater broke out into laughter. And this was after Airbender. So oh, this was after everybody Airbender. Everybody was still really heartbroken over that movie. So the audience broke into laughter. <laughs> and that's not what you wanted for no. the movie called 
the devil or, no, or whatever, whatever the actual the actual title was. Um, you, so you look, trailers are for marketing, yeah, for selling the movie, for getting people excited about the movie and talking about the movie. And I think you and I would agree that if they had put Mel Gibson's name front and center, mm-hmm. as much as I'm looking forward to this movie and I think he's a terrific director, it would have taken away from the mission of a trailer. Mm-hmm. So I, I personally think it was the right move for them to keep his name off and for now. Do you think that he agreed to have his name kept off the the uh, the trailer? Because I think if he didn't agree to and he saw he got mad, I think we would have seen something from him by now. Um, I don't know. I, well, I think ultimately it does. He look. He knows he's the director. He doesn't own the film. The film is owned by the studio, and I think mm-hmm. he knows that. And yeah. he's been in this business a long time. That's true. That's true. So, and you know what? And I got to assume he's a smart guy. And you, if you're a smart guy, you know, yep, probably good idea to keep my name off this yeah, for now. That trailer is sold me. I, I really want to see this movie. Because that's the other thing. If I'm Mel Gibson, I didn't mm-hmm. think about this before, but if I'm Mel Gibson, I know there's a lot of divided opinion on me yeah. out there. I, and I, if I think I just made a really good movie, I almost don't want the controversy i just want people to see the movie focus on the movie say it's hand. awesome then once people see the movie know it's awesome hey by the way guys directed by mel gibson that's <laughs> what i would want if i right. was mel gibson because i wouldn't want people to start talking crap about me now and then yeah. maybe not give my movie a chance yeah so uh, yeah so yeah i think mel gibson probably is okay with this yeah uh I, at least i hope he is All right, guys, that'll do it for me for this installment of the John Campy Podcast, episode number 35. Once again, today is Saturday, July the 30th, 2016. I want to thank my very special guest today, Wendy Lee. Wendy, where can people find you online? Oh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. That's Wendy Lee, S-Z-A-N-Y. And then I always forget to do this every time I go on Movie Talk or I come on your show. I forget to tell them about my YouTube channel. Yes. So it is a channel with my husband and I, and we do movie reviews. We have trailer reactions, various TV reviews and vlogs and it's at youtube.com slash the movie couple channel all right nice and of course people can catch you monday through friday on movie talk hanging out in the chat room that's right and you guys have of course follow me on all my social media just follow me at john campia that's on twitter on facebook on instagram on youtube uh make sure you subscribe to my youtube channel because i put up new videos every day today i'm putting up my video uh the three reasons comic-con needs to move to las vegas uh (laughs) so that goes up today i meant to put up earlier in the week but i just didn't have time to get around to it uh and that'll do it and guys do me a favor if you're listening to this podcast, which obviously you are, even if you don't use iTunes, do me a favor, open up iTunes, find the John Campia podcast, and make sure you rate and comment on it. That helps this show out a great deal. So once again, find it in iTunes, rate and comment. That helps me out a great deal. So that'll do for us, guys. Well, I'll be back with my next podcast on Monday. Again, my new uh, schedule for the podcast is Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. So make sure you check it out then. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks again, Wendy. That'll do for me, guys. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.